All right. Hello, Light of Insight community. Welcome back to another podcast episode where I have a very amazing guest today. His name is David Curtis, and I was introduced to David by my dad, actually, a few years ago. Uh, We both share the same roots in Montana, and Dave is an expert and teacher in Buddhist wisdom, philosophy, culture, um, specifically Tibetan Buddhism, and the language. So I am very excited to talk about all things Buddhism and self-growth with Dave today. So hello, David, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm really happy to be here, Nina. Oh, fantastic. I was thinking about this podcast and how I wanted to structure it. And I had this, this gut feeling that I wanted to ask you this question first. And I've been thinking about Dharma and what that is and how that's important um, to find and discover. But the first question I want to ask you is, can you please explain what Dharma means? (laughs) And can you please (laughs) explain to us what, what, yeah, just as simple as possible and what your Dharma is? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually a big question, but I can say a little bit about it. If we look the word Dharma up, which is a Sanskrit word, and Sanskrit, so the type of Buddhism that I'm into, as you said, is Tibetan Buddhism. And the Tibetans were very, very influenced by uh, the Buddhism coming from India, and the sacred texts were written in the Pali language and also the Sanskrit language. And the Sanskrit language texts had the biggest... uh, effect on uh, the Tibetans. And then, of course, the teachings spread throughout all of Asia. But if we go back to the Sanskrit, it's uh, always fun for me to point out that if, if you look that word up in the Sanskrit English dictionary, there are 10 basic definitions. But the one that we're thinking of, that you're thinking of, and I'm thinking of when we say Dharma, I think those, that's yeah. the teachings of the Buddha. That's that's a just a right. basic definition is teaching the Buddha. Wow. Yeah, I I realize this conversation, there's gonna be so, so much deeper meaning because you are an expert in the language. And being an expert in the language and understanding it um on a deep level, it I'm sure it just uncovers so many more understandings and I guess, worlds of Buddhism. And I guess my next question is, how did you become interested in Tibetan Buddhism and start your journey with practicing and studying the language? Okay. Well, first of all, I should say that I'm not an expert at all, and um, but I have been involved with it for quite some time. But I wouldn't regard myself as an expert in either the teachings of the Buddha or the language. But I like to think of myself as a student. And, um, you know, so usually we think of a student as someone in their, you know, a child or in their teens or 20s in college. But uh, I guess I'm a lifelong student. So then how I got started in it, um, like a lot of things in life, it's kind of mysterious. It wasn't just uh, one thing happened and then, boom, I decided to become a Buddhist. But I think all my life I've been a curious person person just interested in things and asking lots of questions and I think my general curiosity led to my uh, life of inquiry actually Um, there was um, there was a Vipassana journal it published in America some years ago that I really really enjoyed and just read every word in every issue and it was called inquiring mind and so I think that's what I have. Uh, so I'm that kind of a Buddhist that's inquiring always. When um, So well, we can go back to many, many years ago when I was a freshman in college and I was standing on campus and with a group of my friends from high school and we were standing in a little group on the big oval and at the center of campus. and University we, of Montana. Yes, mm-hmm. Oh, which is about awesome. six blocks away from here now. <laughs> um, but where I am right now, I mean. Um, 
And we were talking, and we have these little programs of all the um, courses that were being offered in the whole university, and people were flipping back and forth through them, looking at this and talking about, oh, this sounds interesting, and well, I wonder what this is all about. And um, I had a predilection in this direction, but I opened it to the philosophy department, and it said, philosophy is the love of wisdom. And so I said, I'm going to be a philosophy major. And so I did. <laughs> wow. So was it, was it a phil so philosophy and a focus in Buddhism or was it first Western philosophy? Well, it's quite an interesting story uh, about Montana. And mm -hmm. the, the person that founded the philosophy department also founded the religious studies department. And his name mm -hmm. was Henry Bugby. And he had taught at Harvard. And when he was at Harvard, uh, it's really an interesting story, but I'll just tell the short version of it. But he met this Zen master, D.T. Suzuki, who was a great, great Zen scholar of Zen. And the university, someone from the university had um, made it possible for uh, Suzuki to be a part of anybody's class that was interested. And, and the whole of Harvard at the time, this was back in the 1950s, no one was interested except Henry Bugby, uh, the person that wound up becoming my teacher in Montana. So from the very beginning in the philosophy department, there was this openness and curiosity about what you could call the wisdom of the East, philosophy outside of just strict, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, and then medieval Europe that, that most uh, universities in America, when they talk philosophy or have a philosophy department, that's their concern. But there was always this little thing about Montana because of uh, this great uh, teacher, Henry Bugby, that the, he would teach things that back in the day were called things like Oriental philosophy, based mm -hmm. on what he mm -hmm. learned from um, Suzuki. So that was always going on. And then I grew up in those days in the 60s, it was the 60s, the 1960s. And so there was a lot of interest in India and Japan and in Asia in general and those cultures. So that was always so I started mostly my study and reading of those things, uh, a, a little Chinese philosophy and, and mostly Zen teachings from Japan um, and also things like Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita. That's what I read in my spare time that I was just kind of personally interested in. And and then another man came to teach, and his name was Richard Gottschalk here in Montana. And he had been a student of Henry Bugby's at uh, Harvard. And he was interested in all of these things, too. So he was a major influence of mine. And so, um, so he wrote books and taught courses on, uh, for instance, the... Um, well, the history of philosophy, but some of them... He said philosophy began... And not only in Greece, like most Western people think, but also in China and in India. And so he learned those languages. He knew Sanskrit and Chinese and Greek and German and, and, and studied, the, uh, studied and wrote about the, what I call the wisdom traditions of those non-Western cultures. But, it, but he also knew Greek and, and was an expert in, in Western Greek philosophy. So he had a major influence on me, too. And then um, one summer, I fell in love with a young woman, and um, she moved to um, Seattle. And so I went to Seattle for the summer. I had a job. How I became a Buddhist in particular was that um, it's kind of complicated, but, but just uh, basically what happened was I was hired after I got my BA, and I studied classical languages and philosophy, so Greek and Latin, and a little bit of Sanskrit, and then philosophy. Um, but I got hired to run a company, and I didn't know anything about business or <laughs> about what this company, what their business was. But what that led to was meeting the family and really connecting with the family that owned the company, and they were Buddhist, and so they hired me to be a private tutor of their children. And mm. And I'd never taught children. I'd never taught anything, I don't think. 
And I remember the first day of school. So they also um, gave me a beautiful home, a large home to live in on the river on a thousand acres in the wilderness. And, the, and, um, wow. and so the children lived up the hill, you know, the family lived up the hill. And then I lived just, you know, a one minute walk from them in this beautiful forest in this magic house. But the first day of school, I just sat the kids down on a couch. There were three of them. A four-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a nine-year-old. And the four-year-old didn't really have to be in school, you know, because he was only four. But he could come if he wanted. And he, we had fun, and so he came. And so anyway, I sat them and down on the couch, and they all knew me from before, and we were, I was friends with them. And so I said to them the first day, "Well, what kind of school should we have, you guys?" Mm -hmm. And the middle child was a girl. And named Sarah, and Sarah said, let's have a Buddhist school. And I thought, wow. what a great idea. She was seven years old. And so, Amazing. so so they were Buddhists. They were, their family was practicing Buddhists. So we got a little, I think it was a Guan Yin statue, and then some incense and lit incense, and we bowed. And that's how we started um, the school. And, Ooh, wow. and and then in the evenings, I would read Buddhist sutras with their mother. And then mostly on weekends, I was studying classical Chinese and Buddhism with their father. And he was a real scholar of Buddhism. And so I, I got into Buddhism kind of an odd way. But I like to credit Sarah. So now she has a PhD in Buddhist studies. Wow. The girl, That's amazing. Seven year old girl. And May so, I ask which ethnicity this family is? They're from Seattle, so they're American, or which? Yeah, they're um, they're, they're Caucasian Montanans. Wow. Yeah. Wow! Oh my goodness! Yeah, and wow. the, the parents each separately had found Buddhism, and then when they um, were in college at the University of Washington, which has a great has traditionally has had a, a lot of uh, teaching of the you know, Asian cultures, uh, Tibetan right. and Chinese and Japanese. and um, mm. But they met in a Buddhism class um, in uh, in Seattle. That is so interesting. I'm, um, I think it's really interesting how East meets West and the influence of Buddhist philosophy, philosophy and wisdom, particularly the the relationship with like Western, I guess, science and like psychology and neuroscience like especially now i'm seeing a lot of western psychiatrists and neuroscientists really wanting to work with buddhist monks because of their understanding of the mind and i guess my next question for you david is i saw or i read online that in 1984 you um listened to the 14th and the current dalai lama speak and that was kind of your springboard, another springboard into your deep fascination um, of Tibetan Buddhism. So I'm wondering, can you give us a little bit of a detail of that memory of um, seeing the 14th Dalai Lama speak? And where was this? How old were you? What, what feelings did this ignite in you uh -huh. uh, during that time? The um, Well, the reason I mentioned Seattle first, and then I had fallen in love with this young woman, and since I w so I was teaching nine months during the school year, and then I had the summer off. So in the summer, I decided to go to uh, Seattle and, uh, you know, uh, see if I could develop a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and then, so she was working, and I wasn't working, so I was spending a lot of time in libraries and bookstores. That's kind of what I do, um, mm. even on vacation um, and travel. One time, one of my sons and I um, were driving to Los Angeles, and we stopped at Las Vegas. But unlike most people, we went to the university that's there and went to the <laughs> library and studied. <laughs> but so we're kind of an eccentric family. But... Anyway, when I was in Seattle that summer, and it was 1984, um, um, one of the shops that I would just stop into was run by a Tibetan man, and it was and had pictures of Tibet and Nepal and Buddhist stupas and and such things like that. And, and he was a lovely man, a really kind person. And so he would tell me a little bit about Tibetan Buddhism and a little bit about the Tibetan culture. 
and and for I remember one time he had a he had lots of cool things for sale there that I'd never seen before. One was a great coat, and um, it was uh, lined with sheep. It was a sheepskin coat, and all the fur was on the inside instead of the outside. And he said, "Well, we Tibetans." It's warmer if you put the fur inside, so we do that. And he said, in the West, people put the fur outside. The uh, outside. <laughs> that's the beauty of it, but we turn it inside because it's cold in Tibet. <laughs> little things like that I was learning from him. And one day I just popped into the shop, and I would talk to him, you know, when he wasn't busy and didn't have customers. And he, um, he said to me, you know, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama of Tibet – is coming to Los Angeles in October. And then he pointed at me and said, and you should go see him. <laughs> and so I thought, that's curious. I'd never, I think I just remotely heard of the Dalai Lama, but I didn't even know that there was a living one. Or I did, you know, didn't really. But when I was back to start, start the next school year, and the, the father of the children, and I used to study a lot of Buddhism together, but mostly Indian and Chinese Buddhism, and uh, Chinese language. And I just mentioned that to him. You know, I met this Tibetan guy and he said, the Dalai Lama's coming to LA. Isn't that wild? From old Tibet, you know. The Tibetans mm -hmm. didn't even have the wheel until the 1960s. Really? So they're wow. really off the grid. We talk about people living off the grid. They were like off the grid. Really off the grid. <laughs> Big time. Um, and then anyway, some months went by or weeks went by, and he and I were having tea again. We drank a lot of Chinese tea when we studied. And, um, and he said to me, didn't you say that the Dalai Lama's coming to L.A.? And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, doesn't your mother live in L.A.? And I said, yeah, she does. And he said, I'll tell you what. If you take the oldest of my children, the oldest boy, and that boy was so bright, he was nine years old, and I started teaching him you know, like what I thought a fourth grader, fifth grader should study. And in about one week, we switched to reading my books from philosophy in college and, um, you know, things like Herodotus, uh, the ancient Greek historian, and reading Homer and translation. And then I started teaching him classical Greek when he was nine. So he's nine quite nine years old. Yeah. So he's quite, a, and then at one point I took him to class with my professor and, and sat with him and we took part in the class and um, he had so much fun with that. And then they liked him and, and then he could answer some questions that the university students couldn't answer. So the teacher liked having him. And so, uh, <laughs> so his father and I one time did a two and a half week intensive study where we were studying about 17 or 18 hours a day Chinese. And uh, he taught me Chinese by teaching me Chinese Buddhist poetry, but just by taking one poem and starting with that. Um, and so while we were doing that, his son was studying Greek at the university at nine years of age. He may have been 10 by then, but, you know, quite young. Anyway, that was just a fun little episode. So, um, so I said, well, what a good deal, you know, that is. He, you know, he's going to fly me and the, and the kid down. And my mom thought it was a great idea. She likes kids. And, you know, um, and so um, so then I told my girlfriend, who, by the way, this is uh, 1984, uh, we're married. And we're, so we've been together all that time. Oh, my um, gosh. What's your wife's name? Deanna. Diana, wow, and she's Missoula as well from Missoula. D e a n n a. She's from Billings, Montana. Billings, wow, great. Well, that's where my family lives. That's where my aunt, uncle, and cousins live. Oh, right now. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were both uh, born in the same hospital in Great Falls. What? Yeah, possibly what? the same one your dad was. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say which hospital in Great Falls. A long Falls? time apart, the Columbus Hospital. Columbus. I actually don't know which hospital my dad was born in. We'll have to ask but him. But I know. I'll ask him that. What? So That's, I called her up. What, I called her you? up. And when it was determined that that I was going to go with the boy whose name is Michael, um, and um, he grew up and was uh, was in into animatronics and worked for Jim Henson, who developed the Muppets. And, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And. I like to brag about him too. He won an Emmy um, doing that. Wow! Uh, 
So Incredible. they were quite fun, fun people to be with and lovely people, you know, but also talented and just super interesting. So anyway, I called up my girlfriend at the time, Deanna, and I said, why don't you come down too? We'll stay with my mom and check out this Dalai Lama thing. And so we both went down in October of 1984 and saw the Dalai Lama, and it was a life-changing experience. He was being translated by someone who was a master linguist and, and master of the philosophy and just very eloquent um, speaker, the, translate, the interpreter. Um, mm -hmm. And so we both loved that. We were both philosophy majors. I did philosophy in classical languages, and Deanna did philosophy in French. But then every summer she would go do an intensive, so she learned Russian and German, and then later on Tibetan and Bhutanese, uh, too. She's the real scholar of the family, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, So we went down together, and we were both um, just, I guess we could say, smitten by the Dalai Lama. So the way I put it just for myself is I love the philosophy, just so beautiful and so intricate and then and so being so beautifully expressed and just inspirational. But the really real thing that got me was who the Dalai Lama was just mm -hmm. as a person. And the way I put it to myself was, I don't know what that is that he has, but I want that. Mm-hmm. So then mm -hmm. we actually heard while we were there that that we claim His Holiness, but His Holiness the Dalai Lama would be teaching a program in Switzerland the next summer. Mm -hmm. I'm having a little uh, bit of hay fever uh, issue, excuse me. Um, so, um, and Diana had studied and lived in France. She was, uh, she studied at the Sorbonne and she uh, did, uh, you know, different programs and had lived in France on and off already. So she loved France and wanted to go back to Europe and Switzerland's right next door. And, and we, then we were both okay. interested in this Buddhist thing. And so the Dalai Lama taught a program that was, um, this would have been the summer of 85 then. It was 12 mm -hmm. days long and free. And the board and room was $110. And so, wow, all days. And so, it wasn't very elegant, but it was, we didn't care. And so, um, we went yeah. with backpacks. And I thought, then, then I wanted to do that two week program. Then I thought, then I should also go to Greece because I'd been studying Greek language and, and I love Plato, Greek philosophy, and Homer, Greek literature. And I, I read a lot of Greek plays. So, I love the theater, or the Greek drama. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides. I love all that. I love the whole Greek culture, passionate about it. And so I thought it would be kind of like a pilgrimage to go to Greece as well. And so two weeks in Switzerland doing the Buddhist thing, and then two weeks down to Greece, and then back to my perfect job, you know, living in the forest with this magic family, um, and then learning Buddhism and teaching the kids. And, you know, the... the Second year, Deanna came to live with me, and in the evenings uh, throughout the winter, um, the mother and Deanna and I got together, and we read Shakespeare plays. Wow. And we didn't have a TV, you know, and, and so, so that's what we did in the evening. Anyway, when, mm -hmm. when we went to France, to France to see the Dalai Lama, I then, after that was over, I, I went to Munich to see my aunt who was living there. And Deanna had friends in Burgundy in France, so she went there. And they said, oh, if you're interested in this Tibetan Buddhist thing, just down the road here an hour and a half or so, they're building a big Buddhist temple. And so Deanna mm -hmm. went there, and then she called me. And then um, I actually hitchhiked from Munich to France. And we went together, and we, went, we visited the Buddhist center and met the abbot. And and then I went to Greece, and Deanna enrolled. Deanna went. She was going to study philosophy at the Sorbonne, and she was accepted and even given an apartment in Paris. But when she was in line to register, she met another young woman. So they're both, you know, in their twenties, about twenty-five or something. And Deanna was talking about why she was going to study philosophy at the Sorbonne, and as she explained it to this woman, she talked herself out of doing that and decided what she wanted to do was to go to that Buddhist center and study there. And <laughs> in the meantime, I was exploring Greece 
and um and so um then i came back to munich i i had an adventure in greece i wound up uh um, living on Crete for five weeks and being an extra in a film, and uh, wow. it was a major film. And so um, I was just hitchhiking with not very much money, but then I got a job being in a movie. And so I was doing that. Well, Deanna moved to the Buddhist Center, and then when I came back, I joined her there. And so my original plan of being one month in Europe, we stayed for six of the next seven years. So we stayed to uh, to study Buddhism. And then while we were at that Buddhist uh, center, we were both accepted to the um, uh, to take what's the equivalent, basically, of the um, Tibetan Buddhist seminary. Mm. So mm -hmm. rather than just being kind of weekend practitioners or something, we decided to go all the way into it. And so then we were basically on graduation from that we're basically ordained so we're each uh, officially um tibetan lamas lamas right and this was a i read three-year um seminary or retreat mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. three years how did what did your day-to-day -day schedule look like during that time so for one thing, I like to tell people that we were 150 yards apart. There was a women's cloister and a men's. So we mm -hmm. didn't see each other for three years and some. And so I always oh tell people, goodness. that's a really good test for a relationship. You know, you're in <laughs> love and you're thinking, you know, this could be a, a real thing. So then go yeah. do a meditation retreat for three years and see what you think when you get out. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Was that... I? Was that super difficult? Did you think, oh, no, I need to give up and I want to see my wife? Or did you know that, no, I, I can do it. I know she can do it, too. Um, we're in it together. What, what were you thinking during it? We could correspond, so we wrote a lot. And we had this little, like, okay. little wooden box. And, and then we had a courier that would, um, you know, get mail for us and run errands and buy food for us and things like that. And so then we mm -hmm. had this little box that we would put things for each other, you know, made sometimes texts, Buddhist texts. And um, I, I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is a, a little Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist text, and the books are in this form. They're loose leaf. They're not, uh, they're not bound. So they look like this. Oh, wow. I open up a page where there aren't any words. Like this. That's the Tibetan writing. So that's oh, what so I study beautiful. and teach now. But that was the text for all the liturgies, all the, for the rituals that we recited were all in that Tibetan language. And so mm. that was part of our experience there too. But when it came time to leave, so if you do something like that, so it was 39 months, three years and three months about, and when you approach the end, then you start thinking, well, what will I do next? You know, you know, because there's not a whole lot of like people hiring Tibetan lamas or something like that. And um, and so just coincidentally, we each had an interview with that same abbot that we met the very when we first got interested in the place. Mm -hmm. And um, and we each said to him that we at the end of three years that we didn't want to leave the retreat. We just wanted to stay and continue this for the rest of our lives. So we didn't know that, but we each told him basically the same thing. So we oh, had a very magical, wonderful, and at the same time, I'll say extremely difficult sometimes, you know, yeah. experience and just life transforming and wonderful experience. Wow. I can, you know... I I told you this, of course, the Vipassana retreat I did a couple years back. It was 10 days, <clears throat> nowhere near three years, but 10 days long. But I remember at the end of the retreat, too, the, the beginning of it was super painful. And the middle of it was at really difficult, but starting to get easier. But towards the end of it, like the ninth day, and especially the 10th day, I didn't want to leave. Great. I didn't want to leave. So I can relate to you by the end of it. You kind of just, I guess, surrender and let it all 
go basically and think, oh, wait, this is actually incredible and life changing and transformative. And I don't ever want it to end. I, I can relate with that feeling. Great. Um, but during it, what what were the difficulties and what did your like meditation practice look like? It's good that you were able to communicate through letter writing, but you know, what, what was the food that you were eating was vegetarian? I'm assuming. Or... Uh, no, the Tibetans aren't really vegetarian. Uh, you know, not oh, much okay. grows up there in Tibet, you know, so the, it's an unusual Tibetan that you meet now that they've come to the West um, more Tibetans are vegetarian, but traditionally, mm. you know, there's like a, a almost absolute zero growing season in a lot of Tibet. <laughs> um, a, the the flat areas in Tibet, so we think we're down in the valley, you know, like here in Missoula, Montana, it's about 3,000 feet. The flat mm. areas in Tibet are about 12,000 feet. And when they go over a mountain pass, it's 17,000 feet. Uh, 16, 17,000, 15,000 feet to go over the pass. So the mountains, well, of course, there's Mount Everest, but, you know, so right. the, the Himalayas. Um, so it's very, very high areas. So, the, yeah, not, there's some low down areas, you know, but uh, for the most part, Tibetans aren't uh, vegetarian. So wow. we weren't either. I was a vegetarian for a while, but actually my Tibetan doctor and a Western doctor both told me that that's not really good for me, you know, so then I should eat some meat. Mm, that's, that's important. Just, yeah. I mean, not, yeah. not everyone, not everyone should be a vegetarian based on their health. And that's great that you had doctors to listen to as well. Um, I'm interested during the retreat, were you experiencing a lot of, um, of course, mind and body are very connected. Uh, during my retreat, I was experiencing so much pain all over my body. Um, and of course, because we were meditating for like 12 hours a day, but especially in the moments of mind suffering or looking back on the past and thinking about who hurt you or thinking about, you know, the things you think about when you're in stillness and silence, your mm -hmm. body become so tense and you, I don't know, my back hurt, my heart area hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my stomach was always really, I don't know, it, I can't really describe it. It's like I, it was just really empty all the time. And towards the end of it, I think I started to become much more used to the meditation practice and perhaps the diet we were only eating breakfast and lunch. There was no dinner served mm -hmm. because you stop eating from a certain time. But it's those retreats aren't just mentally exhausting, but like physically draining too. Did you experience that during your three years? Yes, definitely. Um, one thing um, that I'll mention, I guess, is that... Um, I didn't lie down for three years. What? Really? So in the Tibetan three-year oh. retreat, you know what a traditional child's sandbox is like? It's like a wooden frame, you know, wood, just a child, American child's sandbox. It's like oh. a wooden frame around sand, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. anyway, we slept in these boxes that were kind of like that. And then we meditated throughout the day and we had our meals, most of our meals in this box. So it was like um, the length from your uh, tailbone, if you put your feet out um, at an angle in the box, that's, that's how, so from one angle to the other, from one corner to the other at an angle, that's how big the box was. And then it had a side that came up and, and then a back that came up to about right here. Mm. So it was like a some kind of big shipping box or something. And, <laughs> and then it had a tabletop that was removable in the front. So then when we studied or ate, I would reach and pick up this board and put it down across the front of the box. And then, um, then I'd have my text open, you know, like that, like um, propped open like this. This is how the Tibetan book, and then you read this page, and then you um, 
turn the pages like that. But but anyway, um, um, so this box is a yeah. You know, I mean, we could do a whole interview just on the box, right? <laughs> but um, the idea is that 24 hours you try to stay in meditation posture. Now, um, so when I so then the first nights for weeks and weeks when I got there, it took me 20 minutes at night just to prop pillows under my knees because as you know, if you've meditated for 12 hours a day and then you go to sleep, your knees are sore, right? And you just yeah. want to stretch your knees out and maybe go for a walk. Um, the um, but we were to stay in this box. Um, almost all the time we we twice a day we would go to the temple for rituals we had a yoga studio a little temple a kitchen and then homes for 15 people all on the size of the average like urban houses yard and, well actually one time i stepped it off because i was curious but it was 36 paces by 24 paces. Then the temple, the yoga studio, the kitchen, the bathrooms, and 15 little houses were all in that space. So the longest walk that I could take, I was in one corner, and uh, the longest was to go at a diagonal to the opposite end and the opposite corner, and that's where the bathrooms were, and it was 21 steps. So that's as far as I went for three years. And... Um, and so that sounds like a big hassle <laughs> problem or something. <laughs> but actually, what we're doing is we're slowly tuning into our inward life. And that starts to gain predominance. So that the inward life becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the outward life kind of gets smaller for a while like that. Um, and so, so most of the time I would lean back like I'm leaning back in a chair. And that's how I would sleep. And then, uh, but sometimes, you know, you're, it's almost like our body has its own mind sometimes, right? The, and the body says, like, enough of this stuff, you know? And every now and then I would lean over like this in my sleep, and then I would fall down and crash. Mm -hmm. I would crash on the side of this box, and I would jump up and go, <laughs> what, what, what's happening? And one night, actually, I didn't know it, but because uh, I didn't have a mirror, but I went out to do the ritual in the morning, and a couple of people, my friends in the retreat with me, the other men, said, what happened to you? And I said, what do you mean? And, and I had a whole, like, red mark on the side of my face because I leaned against the side of the box and then just slid down, you know, and then did that repeatedly in my sleep. Um, and one time I was really tired in the afternoon, you know, meditating. It was a summer day, and it's pretty hot out. Um, and you're meditating in the afternoon, most people from time to time would fall asleep, right? And one time I fell asleep, and then I had a dream about the Tibetan language and a, a page of the Tibetan book um, looking like this. And um, all the letters were like swirling in space in front of me. And then I woke up. And when I realized that I'd fallen asleep, I was reading a text, reciting a text, and I'd fallen asleep, and my face just went down on the text. And so when I woke up, I was <laughs> looking at the letters like that. So the dream, you know, got kind of mixed up with my daily. <laughs> and, that's like, and so I woke up and I went, what's happening now? You know, the, and I realized that my face had fallen down on the text, but lots of stuff happens when you're trying to meditate for three years, um, day and night. Wow. Did, um, I wonder if the experience, that, I know my experience definitely taught me that everything really is temporary, those feelings of pain or frustration. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, it really taught me like, yeah, your back or your knees are, burning and hurting so much right now but it'll go away and it always does of course it always uh -huh. does go away and those thoughts those really painful thoughts they all do go away I think that's one of the major takeaways from my experience it's you know it's hard to remember that in the moment of like suffering sure. right but sure. once you experience that for 10 days straight and really learn it daily where you kind of understand your I guess pattern like mine was I 
hated the morning meditation at 4.30 a.m. because I'm such a night night owl. You said you're a night owl too. I'm definitely a night owl. I like to read a lot and just I, my brain is racing at night. So I kind of go to bed quite late. And But at the meditation retreat, we are up by 4 a.m. And first meditation is from 4 to 6 a.m. And that was the worst part of my day <laughs> because I was wanting to sleep. And so in the meditation hall, I would just kind of like what you're saying of you coming forward. Um, I started to fall asleep during the meditation sessions and I would get so angry at myself and just at the program and just to so many things because it's so difficult. And But then it always would go away by the um, later morning, uh, afternoon time. And then you mm -hmm. start to understand the, the significance of understanding temporary, the, the law of everything is temporary. Um, what were some, I guess, uh, major takeaways and lessons that you learned about mind, body, yourself during well, your Well, we talk about that. One of the big words that we learned a lot from our teachers that we heard a lot about was impermanence. That mm, they're getting mm -hmm. impermanent. So yeah. the, um, mostly we think I mean, just ordinary people going throughout our day, we kind of think that we're permanent. We don't really think about it, but we don't imagine that we're going to stop being, right? And then um, just the relationships, the job we have, whatever, we kind of have a subconscious or unconscious feeling that it's that it's going to be permanent. You know, so this is what I do. This is what I like. So I'm doing this. Um, but... Um, the Buddha taught that um, some of the um, – the way that I like to put it is the, the downside not of life but of unawake life when we're not aware, um, when, yeah, when we're not, yeah, when we're not aware, when we're not wise, then we attach to all kinds of different things with the hope to make them permanent, whether it's our relationship or our relationship with our own body and our health, for instance. Um, and you know, if you think of professional athletes, for instance, you know, they start out as kids, oh, I want to do that. And so they practice it and study it and get really good at it and then become professional. But then, depending on what the sport is, nobody's doing that sport when there's 50, 60, 70 for most of those sports. So it's like completely impermanent. But the... Um, so the, then the Buddha taught that that's then a source of uh, suffering if we're unaware. But if we're more aware, then we've come to see that there's a great blessing about impermanence as well. So if you think of seeds and and like wheat, you know, or rice, if, if there wasn't impermanence, then it would just always stay a rice seed and it wouldn't grow into the food, you know, the grain that we can eat like that. So... Um, the, so impermanence was an important thing that um, that I continued to learn, you know, different aspects of uh, about it. Um, but there were so many, many things because it was a complete change of life. I'm a nighttime person and I love to read and uh, I love movies and I love people. I'm very much a people person. So I like going to parties. I like going to farmers markets and meeting all the people and talking to the vendors and meeting old friends and new, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. So all the, that was just like, mm, stopped, Psh, you know, no movies, um, no time to read uh, and not much time to study. Even it was a meditation retreat primarily. Mm -hmm. So that, so that was a, a big adjustment for me, but then it started to become so rich, such a rich adventure, like what's going to happen next, you know, and in Tibetan Buddhism, is um, there? There's a lot of ritual uh, liturgies that you read, and then the um, it's tantric Buddhism. So there's a great deal of visualization of like um, archetypal deities that represent life energies. Like for instance, in in um, in China they have Guan Yin, and um, in Tibetan that's Chenrezig, and Sanskrit it's Avalokita. But that's the archetypal energy that's the like you could say cosmic energy and i use that word uh seriously as someone who studied greek the cosmos 
that the root of that word means ordained or beautified. So for the Greeks, the cosmos was something beautiful. Um, and so some universal life energy is love and compassion. And that was one of my favorite things to learn about and to practice. And is um, so we would do a practice that's focused on bringing about, cultivating, nourishing, and causing to bloom and blossom our own native. Everybody has it, native compassion. Some people are really locked down about that, you know, and they don't love and have compassion. Well, Einstein once said that we all live in a prison of such that our compassion is really confined to ourselves and a really small group of people, the people that are in our family and our friend group maybe, and then the people that think like us, <laughs> you know, or like mm -hmm. us. He said our task, he, so he said that becomes a prison for us actually, and our task is to expand our compassion ever more and more to include all of life, all beings, and the whole of the universe and all its beauty. That's our, one of our life tasks, according to Einstein. And I think the Buddha would agree with that. Um, and so, so then there are particular practices that we did to cultivate, that's a very good word, and practice. So when we talk about the difficulties that we're each having with meditation, you know, sore back and all the rest of it, I like to remind people that we talk about we use the verb practice, we're practicing meditation. And I think that's a really good word. So it's an ongoing learning process. And it's not like one day I didn't do it and now I do it. So, you know, now I'm a meditator and now I'm expert at it or something. Right. But rather something that I'm exploring in an ongoing way. The Tibetan's mm -hmm. word for mind is um, the idea it's a continuum, like a stream. Mm. So mind is more of, a, and the universe, and I think everything is more of a flow and a stream than it is a fixed thing. Then when we fixate on things, you know, there's a good Latin word for that is reify. We make things fixed and solid, then we have suffering because life is actually flow. It's more dance and play and, yeah, flow like a river than it is a fixed thing. And I tell my friends, even a river, like you might think a river is a thing, you know, like a tree is a thing, a bear is a thing, a mountain is a thing, kind of maybe, mm -hmm. but not really. Um, and then mm -hmm. so people think a river is a thing. But then when you try to define what the river is or where does the river start and stop and then how wide is it, it's constantly changing. You know, water's evaporating. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like now it's flooding in a lot of Montana and other times it's evaporating and disappearing. But it's a, it's a live, flowing, continuing, ongoing thing that's never the same from moment to moment. And I would say the same is true about you and me and all people. So we try to go, Absolutely. oh, there's Alice, you know, like Alice is kind of an angry type or something, you know, or Alice is this or Alice is that. But maybe, you know, she manifests that from time to time. But actually, Alice is infinite. Everybody right. is infinite, you know, and mm -hmm. then we're all also interconnected. And so the so when we so the Buddha taught that there isn't really self um, of anything, mm -hmm. a tree, the river, the cup, me, you, um, and but then our ego is worried about um well the great Zen master that lived in San Francisco, Shinru Suzuki, one time mm -hmm. told a little story. He went to Yosemite Falls and he said, So the water's flowing over the mountain basically and just crashing down there for I don't know, hundreds of feet, and then there's a little drop of water that's part of the river. And the drop flies up in the air, and then it goes, oh, no, what's going to happen to me? You know, I'm all alone, and everybody else is doing that. And then I'm disconnected, and I'm all out here in space, and I'm falling down. What's going to happen to me? So that's we're like that individual people where, mm -hmm. as, as individual people, I mean, where the drop is actually one with the river. And the river's right. one with the ocean, one with the rain, and one with the whole water system of the planet. It's all one, and you can't have a, a like a wave that's separate from the ocean or even a drop that's separated from water. And we're kind of like mm -hmm. that. We're like a drop or we're like a wave in the ocean, and then the sun hits us, and so we display this way. You know, rainbows can happen in the waves, 
And maybe yes. you've seen those pictures of surfers when they're surfing and there's the big curl and the light shining through and all the rainbows. It's like, whoa, you know, yeah, yeah. individual little drops. But um, mm -hmm. so it's all change and flow and beauty. And then we get into trouble mm -hmm. when we when we rarify, rarify mm -hmm. when we. I call it thingify. That's not really a word, but that would be a literal translation of the Latin. The th <laughs> ray is thing. Actually, our word for ray pup republic, like the Republic of the United States or whatever, that comes from the same word. Ray um, is thing. And pub, the public bit, that's of the people. So it's a people thing. A republic's a people thing. Um, yeah. but then we, we make things solid and then we try, then we hang on to them. You know, so you can think of like, for instance, uh, a young boy and girl maybe fall in love in the eighth grade, you know, and so then they're really clinging to each other. And the girl mm -hmm. doesn't want any other girls getting interested in her boy. And the boy doesn't want any other, you know, boys interested in talking too much, you know, because now you're mine, you know, like, mm -hmm. one, and, we'll, and we'll always love each other and always be together. Well, mm -hmm. that happens sometimes for 50 years or so, but like an eighth grade romance like that. Probably if we right. went back to our eighth grade and interviewed everybody and found out what they're all doing, probably none of them or very, very few, you know, would be still in that relationship. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, right. Oh, that's so amazing. I, I love the idea of, yeah, we are all one and it's, we're always just expanding, growing, expanding. And I often think about the importance of, um, so yeah, loving kindness and compassion and how your loving kindness and compassion energy, if you project that and spread that, it really does cause this like chain reaction. And that's where I really do believe and understand more like how we're all connected and how one's mind really does expand to a lot of other people in a given day. Mm -hmm. And also the importance of like, you know, there's some people that are just so magnetic and you just always want to be around them. And then mm -hmm. after you talk to them and or after you spend some time with them, it, you don't even have to talk to them, just be with them. You just feel so like light and happy. And then you carry that energy to the next person that right. you are with and you're right. around. And like all of that expansion and loving kindness is just so, so, so important but I, given that, um, we, yeah, we are talking about like attachments and also the, the feelings that we, the cravings that we have, I experienced that a lot during my meditation, mm -hmm. um, David, I was so like, you know, going from constantly being on social media and having your technology and always going to your phone and not having that for <laughs> 10 days straight. And also not having the types of food that you usually eat, too. You start to get mm -hmm. these cravings of, like, really salty food or meat. I really wanted to have, eat meat again. And, <clears throat> you know, there's all these cravings that humans want because it provides us with um, that feeling that we think we absolutely need. But once you really reflect and are aware that, hey, no, it's not, it's really just that quick, instantaneous moment. And then it goes away the impermanence that we're talking about too. It's just um, all these concepts are just so important and really practical, but you really need that time and like stillness and meditation to be aware of how it is so important and where your mind really does go and drift to. And um, yeah, it's just so profound. And even talking about it, I, I feel like I could talk to you about this kind of stuff for hours like three four five hours and not get tired of where, where where we can go and what conversations we can lead to but i guess more for my listeners that are really new to you know buddhist wisdom the philosophy and these concepts of impermanence and letting go and detachment and can you give some advice on maybe a simple I guess, practice that anyone can do in their daily life in order to achieve more of whether it's loving kindness, presence, um, understanding of their self, what can anyone do that 
uh, isn't like a three year retreat or a, or something that big at a time, but something that people can do that are interested in kind of what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say to kind of bridge to the, to answering your question from what we were just talking about, which was what we touched on loving kindness and compassion. Um, mm -hmm. The Dalai Lama, by the way, says that his religion is kindness. That's his religion. He said, um, so uh, I've always been interested, I think everyone really is, but uh, in kindness and love and getting along and why can't we have, uh, you know, love and peace in the world instead of having so much of the opposite. But in Buddhism, in the Tibetan schools, they talk about, so enlightenment is the ultimate goal. Um, and so enlightenment is the end of all of our different kinds of suffering and wants and desires, and it's like, total fulfillment. In Tibetan, sometimes I like to tell people about Tibetan words because uh, the Tibetans had a language before they discovered Buddhism, and that language was a distant cousin of Chinese. Um, and so it was a language very much like the Native American languages and a culture very much like Native American cultures that we have, like the Native Americans in Montana, for instance. Um, in eastern Montana, there's a big plain, and so a lot of the Tibetans are nomadic. Um, but, um, so in the teachings, there's a lot of metaphors having to do with the natural world and the love of the natural mm -hmm. world. And one of them, they say the bird that flies to enlightenment has two wings and one of the wings is love and compassion and the other is wisdom and insight. And so then the process of meditation actually is a vehicle. It's a way to become who we really are. One of the important teachings that I like very much is that there, we're actually living in a reality where there are two realities. We think that there's just one, but there's actually two. There's an ultimate nature of reality, and then there's an ordinary nature of reality. So, for instance, Newton came up with a lot of the rules, you know, laws of uh, how the physical world works. And they're all valid. And the Buddha said he doesn't have any problem with that ordinary reality. You know, he, he's not going to say that's wrong or anything. And so, so Newton, and, you know, at the beginning of uh, modern science, discovered all these things. And, and I like to say that's about relative reality. So they're all true. There is such a thing as gravity. And if I drop my mouse, you know, it's going to hit the floor and probably break. Um, but then there's another reality as well. And so now science and math are becoming so advanced that they're starting to intersect with the spiritual philosophies of the world. And it was the, you know, nothing's really black and white, but primarily the East, India and China and Japan and Korea, for instance, um, and Vietnam and all of Southeast Asia, um, not just Buddhism, but Hinduism and the Jain tradition and Taoism, they've been very much concerned with this other reality that you could call the ultimate reality. So that's the dimension of the spiritual truth and spiritual realities there. And so, um, so then ordinary people were kind of living in those two realities, but most people haven't been taught about the inner reality especially in the West, in Europe and America. You know, they, they haven't been taught about that very much. Actually, the 60s brought in a renaissance of interest in what I sometimes call the wisdom of the East, all these different traditions that I just mentioned. Um, so one of the things that we have to do as human beings, and, and then, like, no one knows what, there's a lot of mystery about life, and and it's, you know, some people think that certain books have all the answers, but uh, some of those books were written thousands of years ago, so they're not very good at talking about contemporary problems. Contemporary. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about global warming, you know, or racism mm -hmm. or sexism or these things like this, ageism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, so then a part of the human task if I could say, like acting like I know, but um, it's a theory that I subscribe to, that we need to integrate. We need to integrate 
these two dimensions, the spiritual dimension and the physical, ordinary world dimension. And if we just let the ordinary world dimension go by itself, it kind of gets crazy because then you have, you know, the incredible incredible pollution that we have in the world today and global warming and all of these problems that's people mostly fixed on fixated on how they can have more money and power and take care of themselves right. more and they're not paying attention to the fact that we're all interconnected and we're even interconnected with the elements like fire mm. water earth air and the space right and so right. we used to live in la and one time i actually had kind of a breakdown because I felt I longed to be back in Montana. And then we had two little kids and they were growing up and I was looked out one day and they were like playing with their beautiful babysitter, but they were playing in front of the dumpster in the asphalt driveway. And, you know, you had to go a long distance to the to find grass and you couldn't breathe. Yeah. It's never dark at night, so there's constant mm -hmm. light pollution. It's never quiet. You can't breathe the air. You can't drink the water. And you can't, it's pretty hard to access the nature. Right. Versus when I was in Montana, you know, it gets dark at night. You know, so mm -hmm. we can walk into the woods, you know, at any moment. But a friend of mine said, well, if you want to go to the park, tell me and I'll come and be your bodyguard. He said that to me and my family. Because you just can't go to the park because oh, you might get mugged or something right. in the park right. you know? mm -hmm. so um so when so when things go wrong like that for me it's because we've gotten so fixated on that we're the most important thing the individual person and then um we're well there was a book one time that i haven't read but i love the title and it's called in absence of the sacred mm -hmm. So if we have love and compassion integrated into our life, then we recognize that the other person is sacred. Even if we're having an argument with them or don't agree with them politically at all, their true reality, they're a being of love and compassion and wisdom, but they're alienated from that. They're disconnected from that. So the spiritual journey is about reconnecting with that and then so we do exercises and practices like meditation to reconnect with that and uh, this is a long-winded answer to your question but to get back to what an ordinary person can do the highest buddhist teaching say that what we need to do is relax and don't do anything so some of the highest teachings, I know I'm kind of leapfrogging from talking about very beginning people to very advanced teachings, but they even say, don't meditate. Because wow. often when we meditate, we're used to being an ego person in the world. And so now mm -hmm. I am meditating. And so mm -hmm. like something that you hinted at, and I've had exactly the same experience. I'm just the same myself. Um, mm -hmm. I get a little angry at myself because I'm falling asleep at meditation. And I'm angry at myself because I'm supposed to be meditating, but I'm actually thinking about my sore back or mm -hmm. that thing that I was trying to figure out. I'm writing a book and about Tibetan grammar. And so that thing, how am I going to solve? How am I going to explain that complex little thing? So I tell myself that I'm meditating. But actually, my mind is having all kinds of thoughts about the past, about the future, like you said maybe people that harmed me or maybe people that I had fun with in the past and then mm. like this dangerous situation, you know, the <clears throat> Yellowstone caldera could blow up and, uh, you know, we could all die, you know, or something like that. Um, mm. So some of the advanced teachings on meditation say, don't meditate. Don't do all that wow. stuff that you're doing. Just relax. Mm -hmm. And so... Just be just be mm -hmm. mm. just be and just relax and then when those thoughts come up so anybody can do this you can be like a big time executive at her computer you know and running a business and like doing 15 things at the same time and telling all kinds of different people what but anyone can just stop and kind of go offline for a moment and and maybe just sit up in a meditative kind of way and then mm. just go just mm. let your breath out and then let your breath in and just relax. And so sometimes so many thoughts are happening and when they when they crop up, the 
we beginner people think the thoughts are a problem and actually are sort of back. That's a feeling. That's a thought. We're having a thought about a physical sensation that our body sends to our brain. Right. So then we're thinking about it. This hurts. I don't want to do this anymore. Just like when I was trying to meditate in the night and I would fall asleep and my body would go meditate if you want, but I'm going to lay down, you know, (laughs) um, but so, um, so then this kind of, um, relaxed meditation is just, we just pay attention to what's going on. Just relax and pay attention. And then if this thought happens, it's totally fine. And the thoughts, I used to teach meditation in a house that had a front door and a back door. And, and so I would tell people, so we're meditating, facing each other. Well, the thoughts come in, they're, they're like entering the front door. And then you just acknowledge them and notice them and then just let them go out the back door. Mm-hmm. So you don't do anything with them. You don't go, oh, no, I'm thinking again. It's what a bad <laughs> meditator I am. You know? yeah. Try to just let it go. It's just a thought. It's just impermanent. And if it's particularly a bothersome thought that won't let you go, then you say to it, I'll get back to you later. I'm just going to take mm-hmm. a few minutes and meditate here now, and I'll get back to you later. And so then I can let it go because it'll come back. And even if it's something, oh, I'm looking forward to going with my friend to dinner tonight and we're going to my favorite Indian restaurant. And I, you know, so we're meditating, we're thinking like that. Same thing, so that's just the pleasant thought. And so this, you treat it the same way. Pleasant thought, that's nice. I acknowledge you, but, you know, just um, I'm not going to pay attention to you right now. You just pass on through. and But I will get to you later, you know, so don't worry about mm-hmm. it. And so then mm-hmm. you just have kind of a relaxed and open uh, relationship with your meditation. So it's that kind of a meditative of not meditating. And then when we think, I'm meditating, let's see, I saw that picture of the Zen person, and I've gotten instruction to do this with my hands and this with my feet and this with my you know chin and everything like that, then I can start to get like really tight with that. And when I'm tight mentally or emotionally, that actually is mirrored in the body. So then I start having noticing more back problems and chest problems or whatever it is, I think. But anyway, the, I'm just suggesting just a relaxation meditation where you just, ah, go. And then sometimes when people are having trouble doing that and there's too many thoughts, then we then we give that busy mind, give it a thought. Because you can't think two thoughts at the same time. It's right. an interesting thing. You can think many, many thoughts, even in one second. You know, your mind can jump around so quickly, but it really can't do two at once. So then a thing we can do is just sit up straight, and but in a relaxed way. All the advanced Tibetan texts on meditation, the first instruction is find a comfortable seat. This mm-hmm. is different from some Buddhisms, but get comfortable. So you mm-hmm. find a comfortable See, then if you do sit upright with your shoulders back and down and maybe tuck your chin just a little bit um, and have your feet and hands comfortable and you don't have to be sitting in that cross-legged, if you can do that, you know, if you're kind of a yogini and can do that, that's really good. Do do, do that. But if it's not yeah. comfortable, then don't do it. So the Tibetans tend to sit with their legs more open, but their back straight. And then people can just practice noticing their breath. So we're giving that busy mind that likes to follow thoughts of the past and the future and everywhere, other places, um, we're giving it something to do. So one time one of my teachers, uh, he was actually, I believe, a bona fide tantric master. He said, when we give the mind something to do like that, imagine that you're babysitting a couple of little infants, and then you really have to go to the store for something and so then you try. You could try to tell the kids, now, don't get in any trouble. I'm going to run to the store for five minutes and be right back. Or you could fill their room with toys. Just fill the room with toys. And then chances are pretty good that the babies would entertain themselves with the toys. And you could have enough time to go to the store and come back. That's what he said. And so, But I think there's some wisdom behind that. And so then one of the things we can do, it's my favorite thing because we're never separate from it, is our own breath. And we can do just a meditation of just being the observer. So imagine another analogy is that you're like at a busy park and there's a lot of maybe mothers with children and all the children are playing, but you're just sitting at the park bench. So you're not really involved in any of their games, but you're just noticing them. You just notice 
That's all. And you're not really attached. Oh, I hope that boy makes a basket or whatever they're doing, you know. I hope that yeah. girl scores a goal in soccer or whatever they're doing. You're just kind of watching, right? So you're disengaged, but at the same time present and observing. So we can be like that with our breath because our breath is always with us. And it could be anything. You could meditate on a cup or a flower, sometimes something that's for you, beautiful and uplifting. And so for Buddhist people, sometimes that's like a statue of the Buddha or something like that. But something beautiful, anything beautiful is good also. But I like the breath because it's partly immaterial and partly material. And then, and then we always have it. It's always right there. So we can just notice the breath coming in and out of our nostrils. And so say even we're in the subway or we're at work and we can still stop and... Um, and um, you can put something, a beautiful picture up on the screen even, or or like when we're on uh, Zoom or a program like this um, with Riverside, you can uh, have a little green dot there that's the camera, right? So then I just, and so everybody else in the office, it looks like I'm at work. But no, I'm taking a one-minute break, a one-minute meditation break, and I just go, uh, I sometimes I call it the ah uh, meditation. So first thing I do is just go, ah, uh, I'm just going to relax here. And I focus my attention on that. And I just relax. And if thoughts are happening all over, I can switch from that and just watch the breath going in and out of my nostrils and just stay with that for a minute. And in the beginning, I'm not going to be very good at it. My mind's going to wander. And when I'm, my mind wanders, I just bring it back. So it's very gentle and loving with ourselves about the meditation. Mm. We're, we're befriending ourselves. And we're going, yeah. it's okay. It's the same for everybody that tries to do this in the beginning. You can't do it. Just like no baby can decide, hey, today I'm walking. You know, mm. there's a whole lot of crawling and falling down and hanging on to things then you just keep at it and after a while you you get pretty good at this walking yeah. thing so same with meditation yeah. so you just relax and then if you have more time and if you can be in a beautiful place at the park or you know in the mountains somewhere that's all the better and so then maybe you can and then you slowly can build up with that but i think if we start very gentle and just do for me i just do that oh <sighs> I just let go and relax completely like that. And then I try to stay with that. I focus my attention on that light or something or here. Yeah. And I just try to stay with that for a minute. And the mind will do all kinds of things like, hey, you got that report to get in, you know, at work. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's the ego speaking. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. You just say to it, yes, but I'm only taking one minute. You know, come on, we, we've got a minute. I can take a minute. And then you yeah. do a minute, and maybe after a while you do three minutes. And so that's something like right in the middle of our busy life that we can do. People tell me, oh, I want to do one of those three-year retreats and get away from it all, you know. And so mm. I tell people, hey, try three minutes. Start with that. Yeah, start with <laughs> minutes instead of years, maybe. Oh, that's such great. This, all of this is so such, such great insight. I think that it's so important to be kind with yourself during this journey and process. Like the, just the be Tibetans kind with yourself. Say, yeah. The, the Tibetans actually say there's no one on the planet. And maybe the Buddha said this, I don't know, but there's no one anywhere, no being animal or anyone else on the planet that deserves uh, loving compassion more than you do. Mm. Everybody deserves that. So we can start. So some people don't like themselves very well. So, right. We can start by let's practicing giving that person a break and trying to befriend them, become friends with yourself. Mm -hmm. So it might be you're going to a party and, oh, I know they're bringing that guy, you know, that guy is going to be there. And then, so you kind of don't want to go to the party because that really annoying person's there. But then you could just do a little experiment this one time instead of arguing with him and getting annoyed about his horrible politics just one time <laughs> i'm gonna just see if i could be friends with him i can just see if i can move towards make a couple steps towards being friends with him so then mm -hmm. maybe asking him you know maybe he has kids or a family or a hobby that he likes or what, is, what do you do what are you interested mm -hmm. in you know in america when i grew up people always said well my name's david and then the next question is what do you do and that means right they mean, 
What do you do for work? So lately I, I ask people, what are you interested in? Yeah, yeah. You get a really different, interesting response. And so then mm -hmm. they say, you know, well, I like mountain biking. And last week I went with my friend and we went here. So then all yeah. of a sudden you've got like a commonality and you're talking about what they like and what they're interested in. So this person, if you don't like them, they probably don't like you, right? And then all of a sudden <laughs> you go, well, I still think he's a jerk and really wrong about politics, but he's not a complete jerk, you know? Like, right. <laughs> you know, then after a while, instead of being an enemy, then he starts to be, well, well, he's kind of annoying. He's a bit annoying, you know, or then then it starts maybe becoming kind of neutral. So then we're doing what Einstein said. We're just slowly practicing and expanding our circle of compassion. Mm. And after a while, like some of us already have this, but then we extend that to animals and the planet yes. and plants mm -hmm. and trees. Mm -hmm. And so and many people, like the Hopi people, for instance, they talk about walking in beauty and that everything is sacred. So they lived in a sacred world. I kind of grew up in middle America myself in the absence of the sacred. No one talked about this. And, you know, if someone hugs a tree, even today, you know, they're pretty weird. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hippie. They get a bad, yeah. bad reputation for that, mm. which is so And then sad, if, you're too, if you're too loving and kind, then you get a reputation for being, like, not too intellectual, not too intelligent, kind of, you know, a hippie exactly. or, a person or an airhead or something. So we do. Yeah. So in Buddhism, we cultivate both of those things. We cultivate wisdom and insight. And, and so some people, they work on the wisdom, insight, intelligence, knowledge thing a lot, but they don't work on the compassion thing too much. And then there's mm. other people that work on the loving compassion, but not too good on the insight thing. And so... The balance is key. The balance is very those key. Those are the two wings of the bird that flies to enlightenment, that wow. flies to freedom. It's I love that so, so much. Love and compassion. That is so beautiful. And wisdom. And then, so then our task is to discover actually the infinite beauty that we are. Mm. And we, and so mm. in, in the Tibetan Buddhism, we talk about um, that we all have a Buddha nature, an infinite nature. It's infinitely beautiful, infinitely wise, infinitely loving. And that dwells within us. And we're not in touch with it very much. But as we begin to meditate and maybe do little exercises in compassion like this, well, I don't like that person, but today I'm going to say, have a beautiful day, you know, when I see her on the street, you know, for instance, or walking down the sidewalk. Um, so we're practicing, we're cultivating. So in Tibetan, there's a word gom, and that's the word that gets translated as meditation, but it can mean to meditatively cultivate. So we're using meditation to cultivate qualities. So we all have beautiful qualities to an infinite degree, but we're like a beggar person that lives in a shack at the edge of town and every day comes to town with her little street person sign saying, spare change, please help. But actually at home, she's never been there, but down in the cellar of her house, there's a golden treasure. So she's fabulously wealthy. So this is like a person that doesn't like themselves, that has low self-esteem, that's depressed a lot, maybe very unhappy a lot. They're just not recognizing the beauty that they are, the yes. wisdom, the beauty, and power. Sometimes there's a third dimension that's added to it, and Tibetans talk about these as three protectors. And so sometimes they like personify them as deities. So then they're, mm. but they represent this archetypal energy, and the three are wisdom, love, and power. Mm. So we need to cultivate. Mm hour too. So if I'm going, uh, I'm kind of lazy, I would really like to just take a nap, then go, and part of me says, no, I'm going to do this. So that dynamic energy too. So then I found that if we, if any person or any project, if we integrate those three things to the best of our ability, we have a dynamic energy, but also 
intel informed by intelligence and wisdom and knowledge but also then the third thing imbued with love and compassion and we have those three things in balance then just about anything we're going to do is going to meet with success because we're not just riding over the environment or you know one part of it and going we've got the whole power and knowledge of how to do this we have power and then we have knowledge of how to do this so we're just going to dig the strip mine so we've left out the love and compassion part right but then if we just have the love and compassion part and maybe energy but not wisdom then we can do with very good heart we can still do unskillful things that wind up being harmful things even though the best of our attention i was just trying to help you know but then we're lacking some knowledge or wisdom there <clears throat> so for me our whole life we're in we're cultivating these beautiful qualities that lie within us and we're not separate from the infinite and uh, it's a radical statement um radical means getting back to the actual roots of things the very roots of things that's what radical means it's it's a latin word and actually our word radish is related to radical oh oh yeah that makes sense <laughs> yeah but um yeah so it's a the main thing is the root not the green the root anyway um so the um so then the wise people over the ages all around the world in all different religions and cultures and you know genders and ages wise people all around the world have come up with basically the same understanding and then it's articulated differently and then mm -hmm. sometimes um you know religion comes from the a word that means to bind back so the original idea with religion is to hold us back from doing unskillful things that are going to cause us ourselves harm and other people harm um, but I, I like to make a distinction, and that's really important. So that's where ethics comes from first. It's so like the fundamental teachings of the Buddha. It's in all religions have ethics and morals and manners, right? That's a part of all religions. Um, but that's just a, that's on the relative level still. And then ultimately is this wisdom and love and compassion. And that's our true nature that lies within. So we want to cultivate that and nurture that and bring that out, just like we want to cultivate a radish or some other vegetable or fruit tree right i have a beautiful plum tree right out back um so we want to cultivate that you, know, you might prune it you might water it you know if weeds are growing around it you might remove them maybe at a certain point in its life you need to make a fence so the deer don't eat it but we're cultivating it right and so so the um and then meditation is one of the important ways as buddhists that we cultivate so we meditatively cultivate but there are other ways too such as just Today, I'm going to practice loving kindness. Right. And, and maybe I have a little something that I recite. You know, just something very simple like, may all beings live in love and kindness. May all beings be free. That's actually what we're talking about is, you know, the word ecstasy. That's a Greek word, and it means standing out from. Ex is out like exit is Latin. It means it goes out. That's what exit means. It is, it goes, and X is out. So exit means it goes out. But ecstasy is standing outside of. So that standing out in the spiritual way that I interpret it, I like to think it's spiritual, is we're standing outside of the limiting factors. So there, it's limiting thoughts that make me angry, that make me depressed, that make me sad. That's my own thinking that's doing that, and they're limiting. Yeah. So I want to get free of that. Mm -hmm. And so then the, the Tibetan Buddhists teach there is a basic, beautiful, spiritual nature that we all have, and all the animals have it too. And then some of us are much closer to realizing that than others are. But then our life, life, life task, I think, is to realize that, to make that real. So we all have had touches of love and compassion, touches of profound insight and wisdom, you know, and dynamic energy at times. But if we integrate them all and keep cultivating and developing them all together, then for, then that's the spiritual path, frankly. That's what the spiritual life is. So that's what Buddhism is. Buddhism is an uh, English word that's just made up in the West. It's just an ism, you know, like you could have vacation-ism, like I'm really into, that's what I'm all about, is vacation, you know, like, if, um, and so the root, Bud means to wake up. 
So it's really wake upism. So what are we waking up to? Is our own beautiful, infinite, loving, wise nature. And it's kind of like a radio station, old fashioned radio, you know, if it was thunder and lightning, then the radio signal's not happening well in the rain. It breaks up the signal. So you get static, right? So you kind of get the message from the radio station, but not really. It's mm. all broken up. The signal is broken up. And so that's what we're like with our own loving, beautiful, spiritual nature. So the signal's coming through clear sometimes, and then sometimes it's like all clouded over and we got static happening. Mm. So what we're trying to do is just slowly befriend ourselves and befriend that beautiful, those beautiful qualities that we have and nurture them. And so nurture that. So no matter how depressed we are or angry we are at something or someone, we can still nurture love and compassion by doing a little practice like this. Even if we don't really believe it in the beginning and we say yeah. things like, I hope everyone finds love and joy in life and compassion and safety and health. Mm -hmm. Even that nasty person, you know, right. that, that dictator or something or that person that we know is... You know, just causing so much harm in the world, even that yeah. person. So that gets to be a little bit more advanced practice when you do that. And you can start really small, though, like with the people that you love. Some of my friends are grandparents, and all grandparents are totally wild about their grandchildren, right? They're yeah. grandbabies. <laughs> and so you want to have that attitude, like a grandmother to her <laughs> newborn granddaughter, you know, like that, yeah. that loving and total acceptance. And if she does something that's outrageous, like babies sometimes will, <laughs> then you, that, you don't care. That's okay, because you love them so much that you don't mm. mind cleaning up after them. Or, you know, sometimes a baby might hit you, but you love them mm. so much. You don't really care because the love overrides that. So we can all, no matter where we are, we just start where we are right now and just mm. try to cultivate love and compassion in the world. A real popular mm. bumper sticker that's attributed to Gandhi is, be the change you wish to see in the world. Right. right. Be the change you wish to see. Yeah, I love that. I love so that. that's also process and it's training. All of Buddhism can be summed up, first of all, in um, Japanese, Chinese, Tibetan, and Sanskrit, there's one word for mind and heart. It's the same word. They have the mm. same word for both of those. Mm -hmm. So in the West, we're, we've kind of got them split off, and we're really good at developing the mind. You know? Yes, really, right. Really more stuff coming out all the time just from people's brilliance, right? And they put a lot of dynamic energy into working on their start up or their invention or whatever it is but so often in the west that love and compassion is left behind <clears throat> so we want to integrate all of those and and then recognize we have to give ourselves a break because we're just ordinary people and we're just beginners at this right. i was kindness having lunch kindness to yourself always comes back to that give yourself yes. a break and be kind to yourself yes. Kind of self and kind of others. Mm -hmm. Thich Han, a great Zen master, um, said that um, you can't really begin the work of doing good in the world until you can be kind to yourself mm -hmm. and nurture yes. yourself and take care of yourself. And we all know many, many people that are in really like noble nonprofits doing really, mm -hmm. really good things, but then they burn themselves out completely doing it. They're mm -hmm. so into the cause, they burn themselves out. So then they stop to be as effective as they were in the beginning. And what's happening is they're like making withdrawals on their own well-being bank account. So they're not being wow. friends with themselves and nurturing themselves. But then you can nurture. So all of Buddhism, the, uh, one of my favorite Tibetan prayers says, um, from now until I reach enlightenment. And enlightenment in Tibetan is a magic word I have to share with you. It's jong and chub. And jong is purified. So we all have anger. We even have hatred. We're lazy. We're greedy. We have all of those things. And so we want to work on purifying those away. Just gently, continually working on purifying those away. But we also all have beautiful qualities. We These beautiful minds that we have. I mean, just the very fact that we're speaking like this and we have this language thing. And there's nobody that can't do it. I mean, unless they have a serious pathology of some kind, right? But no matter what family they're born into, what race, what part of the country, everyone has this magic and beautiful thing. 
Um, so, Jong means to purify the limited things, the things that aren't quite right, like greed, hatred, and delusion, anger, jealousy, vanity. So, yeah, I'm kind of proud. So, I got to work on that a little bit. So, part of the path is purification. We're working right. on that. Working on, yep, I'm not perfect, but I'm working on it, right? So, I'm just working on it. Yeah. That very attitude is being friendly. But then, also on the other side, Tube means to perfect or to develop. So then we all, every single person, even a mass murderer, has love and compassion. It's very tiny in there somewhere. But then those the beautiful things like love and compassion, wisdom, care and concern, creativity, joy, those are all beautiful things that we have that are qualities that have to do with our enlightened nature. So we want to develop them and perfect right. perfect them so enlightenment that's so important to remember like you already embody all that you need all of this like yes. loving kindness it's already in there but just like you're saying you need to develop it and nurture it and give it time give it time it won't just like develop in a day so, or two <laughs> so we're just like a river and everyone knows the old greek saying that you can't step in the same river twice Mm. Maybe not everyone knows that, but anyway, I've known it for years and love it. Heraclitus said that, an ancient Greek philosopher, because the river is constantly changing. Mm. I mean, exactly. somebody can, I don't know, like pour a glass of water in the river, it just changed, even if it happens a thousand miles away. So it's not the same river, right? A deer steps in it, so it's not the same. Some of the water stuck to the deer's legs when it got out, so the river's not the same. The river's constantly changing and growing, and we're a river. We're, we're, we're a flow, a continuum. Buckminster Fuller um, was a great uh, scientist in the 20th century. I think he had 200 patents. And he invented the geodesic dome. And wow. one, time, one time I was going through like some used books that, that nobody wanted. They were like free books. And I came upon this book and I'd heard of him, but I couldn't read his like scientific stuff. I just didn't have the scientific knowledge to read his advanced things. But I found this little book and the title of it was I seem to be a verb. And that that book has stayed with me for decades. So we're not things. You know? So like a noun is a thing, right? A noun is a person, a thing. But a verb is a process. It's a doing. It's a flowing. It's an unfolding. It's more of a dance. So I that's seem to be a verb. I like that. So I love talk that. About the mind stream all the time. The mind stream. Not the mind fixed brain organ thing, you know, like the brain could be said to be a thing, like it's an organ, you know, um, mm. but actually there's a connection, the mind and brain aren't the same thing. Um, there's a definite connection, yeah. but they're not the same thing. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh, David, we're going to have to wrap up here pretty <laughs> soon, but I... Mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to have to have you back on my podcast because there's so many other um, stories that I want to hear from you. And I want to even hear more about the language of Tibetan and understand everything you know about Buddhism. Like you are seriously a lifelong learner and I can understand your passion with how you just know so much and talk about these, your interests. And I just wanted to say like, thank you so, so much for, um, you know, agreeing to having this conversation with me. Uh, and just one last question. I know you have your, um, your Tibetan Language Institute in Big Sky Mind, but for the listeners, where can they find that information? I know you do have a website, correct, that mm -hmm. I can link to the bottom. What yes. is the name of that? We have two. And one mm -hmm. of them is Big Sky Mind Montana dot mm -hmm. org. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is uh, Tibetan Language Institute dot mm -hmm. org. But if you just put in, you can actually put in Tibetan Language David or <laughs> Tibetan Language Institute, though, you'll find us there. So we have a very developed uh, website for the Tibetan Language Institute. And then um, the um, Big Sky Mind uh, website is a little more... Um, humbler but we want to I'm, I'm i'm recording um more and more videos to put up on the uh, i mind website and we have a group that meets on zoom uh, every monday night and so oh, we, wonderful we say a couple recitations 
one of the recitations that I wanted to share just in closing was uh, from now until enlightenment, I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, the teachings, and the Sangha, the community. So our interconnected and our interrelationships with the community of people is a vital part of what it is to be a Buddhist in Tibetan Buddhism. And then we make that commitment until we achieve enlightenment ourselves, until we complete this process of per uh, perfecting and purifying. But the key part of it is we, we're on that path from now until enlightenment, but the whole raison d'etre, the whole reason of doing it is to become someone who can benefit others. Right. There's always that part in Tibetan mm -hmm. Buddhism. I'm trying to reach ecstasy myself, set myself free of these constraints, so achieve awakening liberation myself, but for the benefit of everyone. Mm -hmm. So we're taking everyone with us, as it were, on the path, on the journey all the time. Mm -hmm. And and the others mm -hmm. are our teachers, sometimes uncomfortably so, sometimes joyously so. And so we embrace that. It's so interesting. Like it is, right, we talked about our individual journeys during our meditation retreats and practices. But we need to also remember, right, we're always bringing others along. It's actually not an individual journey. It's you're connected with so many others and um, the nature, the natural world. And uh, I love what you said about the wings, the wisdom and the loving kindness. I mean, there's just so many amazing takeaways that I want to just talk to you about for so much longer. But, um, but thank you again, David. I'm definitely going to ask you again to be on my podcast. It was so, so amazing. And, oh, great. Um, well, you're very, very welcome. And oh, and thank you. you for asking me. You might not believe it, but I'm kind of shy. And uh, But then once it turns into dialogue with another person, then that all goes away and I talk too much. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, I can relate with you. I'm, I, I feel like I'm more of a shyer person, but I can get in. When I'm conversing with someone, it doesn't feel like it, all of it just goes away. So... Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And I thank you all of the Light of Insight community for listening in. And uh, thank you again, David. Have a great evening there in Montana. You're very welcome. Thanks a million, Nina. And have a wonderful evening yourself and everyone that's listening. Have a beautiful, joyous life. I'll just leave you with one Greek word that seems to not have anything to do with Buddhism. And it's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And enthusiasm means to be in touch with the divine that's within. Mm, so we're, when we're enthusiastic, we're in touch with that sacred divine, what you could call Buddha nature or awakened nature that we have within, that's infinite. Mm. So it's infinite love and joy and bliss and wisdom and creativity and all of that. And that's, that's our true nature. And so we're on a journey to dis cover that so it's covered mm. up now discover it and set it free wow i love that <laughs> that is beautiful right. enthusiasm is a big key too in life absolutely absolutely all right okay. thank you so much david have a You're great night welcome. and night. thank you light of insight bye bye thank you very much okay um